Welcome everybody uh, to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and today we have a subject matter expert who's really in the hot seat and was willing to say, yeah, go ahead and ask me anything. And today, ask me anything about life insurance. So this is gonna be a real education for probably most of us. Now our session today lasts for anywhere from half an hour to an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guests and the attendees alike. And questions and comments are always welcome. So, but if there's something you'd like to ask, maybe anonymously, you can just put it in the chat to me and I'm happy to share it for you. Our topic today is leveraging life insurance. And I am so excited to introduce today's subject matter expert, Michelle Farrell. Michelle is the CCO and partner at the Financial Architects. And when we started talking about doing this show, I was really, uh, really fascinated because just some of the things, I went out and looked at Michelle's website, started looking at some of the things they said about life insurance, things that I had no idea about. So I think this is gonna be really, really an awesome conversation. So Michelle, without any further ado, I'm handing it over to you. So take us there, girl. Awesome, thank you, Patty. And thank you ladies for joining us today. I'm super excited to um, have an opportunity to educate our mission statement here at the Financial Architects is to educate and empower everybody in society to make better money decisions. And one of the, the foundations that we have for your money is life insurance. So think about if you're gonna buy a house or you're gonna build a house. And one of the most important things that you need to make sure is structurally sound is your foundation. So that's what life insurance is when it comes to your, your money plan. So you, you get a really strong foundation of life insurance and then you work on getting out of debt your emergency fund building assets retirement and then just kind of play money so it kind of you build up on top of each other and in in that order so that way god forbid something happens to you um, your loved ones aren't devastated so i want to talk just a few minutes of why i got into the business so I was, um, it was a couple of days after my ninth birthday and I was visiting my grandma in Iowa. I lived here in California and um, we found out that, I found out that my dad had passed away. And um, three weeks before that he had, um, he was employed, he got laid off. And when he got laid off, he lost all of his life insurance. And so the, the 31st of July hit, um, he lost all of his insurance. And then August 14th, he passed away of a heart attack at the age of 52. And my mom was just starting to get into the workforce. Uh, my dad took care of everything. And he really, you know, he took care of the investments, managed the money, all of that kind of stuff. So now my mom's a single mom, just getting back into the workforce back in 83. And there wasn't, you know, there wasn't the information we have available today. There wasn't an internet. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't Google, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't even the commercials to kind of tell you who to call. Um, basically what most people knew at that time and even some, to some extent today is you've got your big wire houses and insurance companies that you see on like Wall Street that handle the, you know, the top, you know, 10% of, of America. And then what is everybody else gonna do? And, um, my mom, so my mom lived paycheck to paycheck, uh, just trying to kind of make ends meet. And so she didn't have anybody help her with her retirement planning either. So at 65, she got sick, had to medically retire. And her mindset was, I'm just going to work until I die. So she never really thought about retirement. She didn't, she kind of knew what her 401k was, but she kept drawing money off of it because she was living paycheck to paycheck. And she didn't know that the, how big the cost really was. And so she retired with 9,000 in her 401k. Um, now that she's sick, she has no life insurance. And she really, and now I'm her financial caregiver, um, her, her really her everything. So I have to make all of her decisions for her. And God forbid she needs to go into some kind of 
um, long-term care facility, she needs some additional help, um, there's no financial resources to be able to take care of her. And so a little over five years ago, I was looking at what did I want to do with my life? I come from insurance. I've been in insurance for going on to, this is my second decade. I first started as a claims adjuster for auto insurance. So I got to investigate car accidents, tell people, hey, you're at fault for accidents and, or your injuries aren't worth anything. And so I wasn't getting in any fulfillment. And even as, as recent as 2008, I'm like, you know, Wall Street sucks. You know, like Occupy Wall Street because I wasn't educated on all the financial tools that are available um, to us in middle America. And I got introduced to a, a different company, but I loved the, the platform. And I'm like, well, this is what I could, I could take what happened to my mom and I could use her to fuel my passion, which is absolutely what I've done. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. Um, so I wanted to share that with you because when I talk about life insurance, I get really nerdy and passionate. Um, so <laughs> feel, free to, feel free to interrupt me at any time, ask me any questions. There's no stupid questions. Um, life in, there's so much about life insurance. Like I'm still learning new concepts today. Um, just because there's so many tools you could you could use with life insurance. Mm -hmm. So one of the first, I just want to kind of we've got a small group here. So who on the call um, has life insurance? Okay, good. All right, almost everybody. Um, that's really great. And then there's two different types of life insurance. Um, let me actually take a step back. So it's great everybody has life insurance, but one of the questions is, do you have enough? Do you have too much? And is it the right kind of life insurance? Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are really important questions because there are a lot of different types of life insurance. And depending on what kind of agent or advisor you talk to, they're going to tell you, well, it's the right kind or the wrong kind. And really, it doesn't matter what the advisor's opinion is. It's what are your needs? What do your needs dictate? And sometimes it's a combination of multiple policies. Um, so I'm going to kind of do a 30,000 foot view of what is life insurance, a couple different types of, of life insurance there is out there. And then as business owners, I'm going to talk about a few ways we can leverage it for our businesses. Um, so does everybody know what the difference between term and permanent insurance is? Okay, good. Um, which isn't uncommon. Most people don't know the difference between the two. So um, imagine term is you're renting an apartment. So when you rent an apartment, you sign like a, a six month, a one year, a two year lease, right? And then after, and you usually get into renting an apartment less than buying a house. Um, and then once that, apart, once that lease is up, it usually costs you a little bit more. Um, so the good thing is that you get in um, very, you get in a lot less money than you do a permanent policy. It's not, it's not a permanent policy. So if you want to say you get yourself a 10 year term and after year eight, you want to, um, uh, if you want to get rid of it, you can, there's no penalty or anything for getting rid of it. Um, but when you walk away, you have no equity. So imagine you were in the same apartment for 10 years, you painted, maybe you painted the walls, you did the flooring, and um, even being there for 10 years, your, the property value went up. Well, at the end of that, do you think the, the homeowner or the, the building over the property owner is going to say, you know what, thanks for being such an awesome uh, uh, tenant, Patty. You know, you know, the property value on this over the past 10 years went up 15%. Here's your cut of equity. Mm -hmm. They're not going to give you that. The insurance mm -hmm. company gets to keep all of it. That's why it's so inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Did you know only 3% of people actually ever use their term insurance for mm -hmm. death? Because most people wow. get it when they're young and they, and it runs out or they cancel it before they actually pass away. So there's some really good reasons for term insurance. If you need a lot of insurance, um, maybe while your kids are alive or while your kids are still in that dependency age from like one to, you know, ages zero to 20 or even 30. Um, you're like, I want to make sure that my spouse's income's complete. Maybe you have a 30 year mortgage 
and you're like, I've got a 700 or a $500,000 house and I want to make sure that my mortgage is paid off at the end of that term or after 20 years, most of it will be paid off. So I want to have a big chunk of money just for the, the period of that mortgage. So those are some good ter reasons to have term insurance personally. On the business side, you could actually insure your business partners. So let's say Christine and Monique are business partners. They decided um, to open up a retail shop um, and they're 50-50 partners. Well, one of the, the ways to protect your business and say both of them are married is God forbid um, something happens to, um, I'm gonna pick on you, Christine, because you were the first one on. Um, something happens to, <laughs> to Christine and and she ends up um, she ends up passing away um, two years after the business. Now what happens is her husband inherits Christine's estate. So now Christine's husband, we'll call him Bob, is now Bo uh, Monique's brand new business partner. So then Bob gets to show up and say, okay, this is how we're running things. Or if you both have life insurance, you have a set amount, a set buyout amount. Bob, um, Monique could go, you know what, Bob, here, I'm going to buy your percentage out. Monique buys out the shares of Christine's, her 50%. Now Monique's the sole business owner and Bob is compensated for his shares. Because maybe Bob doesn't want to, uh, you know, own a retail shop that's all fashion um, based. You know, that's not his cup of tea. You know, Christine brings in these tote bags. Monique's got this fabulous, uh, fabulous clothes. Um, but Bob doesn't do, you know, Bob's not that kind of guy. So um, it's one of the ways, you know, like, okay, after 20 years, you know, then we'll reevaluate, you know, maybe there's enough equity in the business where, or there's enough assets built up elsewhere. But that's another reason why we could use a term person for a policy and we could leverage, um, we could leverage it for our business. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about permanent for a second. I, I like to say permanent is like buying a home or owning a home. So it costs you a little bit more because you have property taxes and you've got homeowners insurance and you've got maintenance. So it usually takes a little bit more to get into it. Um, the good thing about permanent is just, as, just like your mortgage, as long as you're paying, you pay your mortgage for 30 years, that home is yours to keep forever. Um, what usually happens with property values? They increase, right? Um, so I'll use my condo, for example, my mom and I, um, we own a condo together. When I started taking care of her, we bought a condo. Uh, we bought it five years ago and it was worth $250,000. Now it's $320,000. That's a pretty good return on some property value. Well, if I rented it, I would not, and I, and I moved out, I wouldn't get any part of that 70,000. If I sold that property today, I would get that 70,000 in equity. So permanent, a permanent policy has this ability to accrue cash accumulation in it, um, which is really, really awesome. Um, and it also will be around when you most likely need it. The average term policy, there's some, there's some term policies out there that will terminate at age 70, or they're going to be super, super expensive to, like it's going to be several thousand dollars a month in order for you to keep it. A permanent policy, because you've been paying it throughout its lifetime, you'll actually either, most likely, either have the policy kind of paid off, or you're gonna be able to lock in that premium until age 120, which is a really important thing to, to know about. Also, you're able to get insurance as, as early as usually six weeks. When you're six weeks old, you could get a, a permanent life insurance policy where, for example, I've set it up for a kid where they're brand new, newborn. Um, the parents are paying $50 a month for, say, 20 years. The kid doesn't, after that 20 years, that child doesn't have to pay any more into it, but the cash accumulation continues to grow. Say they never touch that money by age 60, 65, they're going to have close to a million dollars of cash value that they're going to be able to use. And that cash value, for the most part, you get to pull it out income tax free. Wow. So another way, yeah, so another way to leverage the cash accumulation of life insurance 
is to use it for supplemental retirement purposes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I'm going to go into a couple different things. So who here has heard of a 401k plan before? Mm -hmm. Right? So there's a couple of rules around a 401k plan. You can't touch the money until you're 59 and a half. Generally, if you do is a 10% penalty, unless you have a pretty drastic scenario, like you're, you got disabled, laid off a hardship. Um, and then you're only usually able to take like the first 10,000 without a penalty, but you still have to pay taxes on it. So let's say you, you're, this is what happened to my mom over and over again. She's 50 years old, takes out 10,000 out of her 401k. She's got a 10,000 or 10% penalty, which is a thousand dollars. Let's say she's in a 20% tax bracket. That's $2,000 in taxes. So out of that 10,000, she just reduced her retirement account by, she only gets to keep $7,000 of that, mm. which is really, really tough versus you got accumulation of life insurance policy. If you have that money there, for the most part, you're able to pull that out income and penalty free. So you want to go pull out $10,000, guess how much you get to keep of it? $10,000. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's really important to look at what type of insurance is necessary. So a lot of times when I'm doing full financial planning, because I also do assets under management, I do health insurance, Medicare, I, I really do it all when it comes to financial planning. I look at what's the purpose of life insurance? Are you covering a business expense? Are, are you covering a business partner? Are you looking at filling that financial hole that is left behind because your loved, your spouse, uh, has passed away. Um, are you looking at it like I want to make sure I leave a legacy for my kids, where I want to make sure there's if God forbid something happens to me, they have money to buy a house in the future, or maybe I want to pay for my my grandchildren's college education or my child's education. So we do a detailed uh, analysis, which which we look at. Well, do you need debts that are paid off? How much income do we need to replace? Do you have a mortgage? What kind of educational legacy do you want to leave for the kids? Especially if we have like a higher income or a higher, uh, uh, like uh, my mind just completely went blank. You have a higher income person, they have a lot of assets. One of the things we want to make sure is that are they going to owe any taxes on those assets? You have somebody that owns maybe their personal house and a couple of rental properties. Well, once as a married couple, you hit $11 million of assets. Now you have to pay estate taxes. So maybe we need a life insurance policy to pay those estate taxes. And you don't want to put that in a term policy where your term policy expires at age 77 and you decide to live until age 85. Like, do you want to, do you want to pass away on your schedule or by when your insurance policy runs out? Wow. I'm going to stop you right yeah. here for a second and, and see if anybody's got any questions because my head is spinning right now. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of, I, and I thought that I knew a lot about this, you know, but um, anyone have any questions or anything that you want clarified or um, any insights? Michelle, you're, you're giving so much information. It's a, uh... I'm, I'm, I'm writing notes as fast as you're as trying to catch up with you. And I'm like you, Patty, I'm a little overwhelmed and I don't even know where to go with my questions. <laughs> I know I, I warned you guys, I totally geek out about that. So I apologize. So, so let, let's back up. So um, does everybody understand the difference between like the term policy and the permanent policy? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. And, good. I, and I think your analogy to, to renting versus buying is really good because that's something most of us can understand, you know, so that was a, a, good, a good analogy. Good. And, and like do I, all term policies expire at 77 or is that just an example? That was just an example. Okay. So, um, that, and that's a great question, Lori. So thanks for, for asking that. So let's, I'm 45, let's say I buy a 10 year term it expires at age 55. So a lot of companies will automatically renew it for me, but they're gonna base it on age 55. Well, now I'm 10 years closer to dying. It doesn't matter when I die, I'm automatically 10 years closer to dying, right? Every day we get closer to passing away. Um, there's, there's no way around that. Um, and so 
most companies offer uh, like a 10, 15, 20, 30, some even offer a 40 year term. So when we're sitting down with a client, there's a few things that we look at. You know, do you have dependent children? Um, do you have a mortgage? Uh, we kind of look at your life expectancy. Um, I'm sorry, I've got somebody in my office. I apologize, ladies. Um, some in the very front office, we had a delivery guy come in. Um, so dependency, uh, mortgage, you, you look at, also, what is your, what is your family's history tell you? Like my family history, my mom is her oldest living relative at age uh, 73. Everybody else in her family has passed away before age 70. But I've sat down with clients and are like, my, my great grandma is still kicking at age 100. Well, then we're going to want to do some, some planning that's based on you've got, your family has some longevity because we don't want you to have a policy that, that ends before you do or ends up being more expensive than you could, uh, than you could afford because now you're, re you're in retirement. Most people can't afford to pick up a very hefty insurance bill. So that's why I usually do a, a big chunk of it in term, term for when you, for how long you need it. And then I have a permanent policy kind of depending on what, what people's goals are in retirement. You know, like, do I want to travel the world? Um, you know, am I married? Am I, am I going to live in my forever home that's going to be paid off? Or am I going to downsize and at age 60, I'm going to incur a brand new um, a brand new mortgage. So those are all different things that we look at. Did that answer your question, Lori? Yeah, yeah, okay, definitely. Good. I see. So you're, you're kind of locking in the rate for the 10 years as well, is that right? So whatever yeah. the term length is. So like you started to say something about some, in, some companies will automatically renew it, but it would, it would go up is basically what you were what exactly. you're saying mm -hmm. yeah exactly and with a permanent policy you pay more up front but we're they're looking at what is it going to really if we're going to have the policy go to age 120 what is it going to cost to insure you for 100 at age 120 and they're going to spread the cost of that insurance out all over those years so maybe you you get the policy at age 45 and a term policy let's just say is 50 dollars a month but we were going to look at a permanent policy. Well, that may cost you $150 a month. But you know, at, and if you've got a good insurance advisor, they're going to actually try to get that where you have it paid in full kind of by retirement. Um, but let's say you keep continuing to pay it. It doesn't matter if you get cancer, if you get diabetes, you have a heart attack that permanent policy is generally that that is going to be locked in uh, for the rest of your life. And Michelle, is it like if you have a permanent policy um, that obviously you're going to be using all the way until the day you die, right? That's mm -hmm. the whole idea behind it. But for the the interim years where maybe you're still raising children or you're still a huge percentage of the, the income of the family or so forth, you can have term that might be say 20 years or something and you're covering those 20 years of high income, blah, blah, blah. And then that expires and you've got your permanent that goes to the end of your life, right? Is that, right. okay. Exactly. Got it, okay. You got it. Good summary there, Patty. <laughs> And um, it's also to, uh, to know what kind of advisor you're working with, because there's some advisors that are what are called captor, captive or agents that are called captive. So they only sell one type of insurance. So Primerica, uh, New York Life Agents, State Farm Agents, Farmers, they have a good product, but they only could sell you that type of product. So they only, you go to a New York life agent, they only could sell you that New York life product. Mm -hmm. It may not be the best fit for you. Somebody like myself, who's not captive, it gives you a couple things. It gives you uh, a variety of choices, depending on what type of insurance you need. We could go out there and pick the right policy for you. Also, 
let's say you have somebody that has diabetes. Well, some insurance companies are like, we don't want to deal with anybody with diabetes. We're just going to either charge them a lot or we're not even going to cover them. Mm -hmm. There are some other companies that are like, we're willing to take on some risk. So yeah, it might be a little bit more to, to insure you, but we're going to go find that that policy for you because we could represent we represent every insurance company out there do we have our handfuls of companies we go to for the most part yes because we know what benefits that they they cover does that make sense everybody mm -hmm. sure good and the other thing i want to tell you about life insurance because patty you mentioned um, that you work with somebody that has helped you with your long-term care planning too. Mm -hmm. um, kind of old days, there used to be um, a standalone, well, there uh, still exists a, long, a standalone long-term care policy. You used to be able to get this fairly inexpensive um, and they used to be separate from your life insurance policy. Well, what's happened is now, did you guys know that 75% of people will need a long-term care policy at some, or long-term care, uh, will have a long-term care events at some time in their life. Mm -hmm. So that means four out of six of us will have a long-term care event. And what I mean by that is they're not able to do two of the six activities of daily living. Like they're not able to feed themselves, they're not able to go to the bathroom by themselves, they're not able to ambulate, get out of bed by themselves. And so if you're not able to do two of those six things, you know, there's usually a 90 day waiting period, then they'll give you a monthly, a monthly stream of income for either your lifetime or two years or five years, kind of depending on how the policy is set up. Because not every policy is, is equal. Mm -hmm. The new type of life insurance, and one of the, the reasons why we pick a couple of the companies that we do, is it doesn't matter if you have term insurance or permanent insurance, they include what are called accelerated benefits, which means that, let's say that, um, Lori, you have a $500,000 life insurance policy. Doesn't matter if it's a 20 year term or a permanent life insurance policy. They're gonna provide those long-term care benefits if you get sick while you're still alive. So you're able to use life insurance while you're still living. Let's say, God forbid, you have a heart attack, cancer, stroke. So this is one of those stories that I, um, I thankfully haven't had anybody that's needed this claim, but one of my associates has, and he um, was able to get somebody. So he had a client who wasn't able to get life insurance because he had cancer. There's a, usually a five-year period where you have to be in remission before life insurance will provide ins uh, life insurance for you. They were able to finally get him life insurance. A year later, he ends up getting sick, ends up with stage four cancer. What they were able to do, instead of waiting for him to pass away, where now the wife's at home taking care of him, he's no longer working, so automatically his income has deep stopped. They're having medical bills build up. What they were able to do out of their $500,000 policy is they were able to take a lump sum of $300,000, pay off the mortgage, replace her income, they were able to take and do a family vacation um, across Europe while he was still alive. So they're able to create that memory. And even though um, there was only $200,000 left at the end of the day, they were still able to use so much while he was still alive. And so not all, a lot of insurance companies don't offer this, especially on the term insurance side. But we have, we have carriers that will do both, which is, it's, What's that so, called? Wow. It, um, so it's either, um, it's life insurance with living benefits, living um, but not all living okay. benefits are the same. So some insurance companies say, yeah, we have living benefits, but it could be just a, what's called a terminal illness rider, which means like, we'll only give you an advance if you're in your, the doctor says you're within your last 24 or your last 12 months. Um, and so it's not exactly the, it's, not all living benefits are equal. So you need, to, you need to be with somebody that's educated, is not captive, and to let you know. Some carriers will say, well, if you had a previous heart attack, we're not gonna offer you your living benefits, and other carriers will. So it's very important to know what carrier you're dealing with too, because they may exclude those living benefits off 
even though 90% of the people they insure have those living benefits, it may get excluded off of the policy if you have a history of, um, say, a heart attack. They may say, well, we're not going to provide living benefits because you already have a heart attack. You probably have another one again. Or other carriers are like, we don't care if you qualify for insurance today, we're going to extend our full range of benefits for you. Wow. Any questions about the living benefits, ladies? I have one. Um, are there any pros and cons to the accelerated benefit over like a viatical settlement? Um, it depends, because not knowing the terms of viatical, generally yes, because of the fact that you're getting it income tax free. And I okay. don't deal with a lot of viatical settlements. I don't know if you get those income tax free. What does viatical mean? It, yeah. it basically, I was going to ask you to repeat the word. I didn't even know what the word was. <laughs> That's a great question, Christine. So basically what you're doing Christine's is... Christine's so smart. <laughs> <laughs> you basically, let's say I have a... Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> let's see. There we go. Um, so we're so this isn't completely pull through, uh, Patty, my, my new web technology here. Um, <laughs> so a viatical settlement is, say, um, Elizabeth has a life insurance policy, and she does need money because she's sick. And um, she's got her, um, say she has her mom as her, uh, her beneficiary. What she does is she sells her basically part or all of her life insurance to a company and make them the beneficiary for a partial advance of the death benefits. So say that's always a $500,000 death benefit. What, they'll, what they'll, she'll do is she's like, okay, I'll take 350,000 of that today. And now, you know, XYZ company, now you get my full $500,000 death benefit when I pass away. So that's those commercials that you're starting to see yes. where people say, I, I could sell my policy. Okay. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And if you sell it, you're not going to get the living benefits. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to get the continued growth in the cash value. Remember, we go back to the beginning, we get the cash value. Guess who gets the cash value? The new owner of the policy, because you're, you're basically giving ownership of the policy over. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're- What's that the, word? Will you spell that word? Yeah, it is. Well, I'll type it in the- Oh, okay. Good. I think that's how you spell it. Um, oh, viatical. <laughs> okay, never viatical. heard of that. V-I-A-T-I-C-A-L. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I never recommend, I don't, I'm not familiar with them because I would never recommend that. At least I haven't had that situation come up to, to sell it. Um, I think there's just too much to lose. Um, but again, if you're looking at, I'm, I'm going to lose my home. You know, I have no other choices. You, that may be an option. Um, but those are for the policies that you don't have any benefits with. Mm -hmm. So, um, and those, those policies tend to be a little bit cheaper a little bit less expensive because if you're getting all these living benefits, they're a little bit more. And by a little bit more, I mean like $10 more a month, which will actually talk some people out of it, um, hmm. which, is, which is crazy in itself. Mm -hmm. um, what's also good is a lot of the term insurance policies that we work with, you can convert it to a permanent policy without having to be rewritten or re-underwritten to qualify for so let's say, Lori, we go back to your 20-year um, policy to cover your mortgage. And then in year 13, uh, you end up getting cancer. And you're like, okay, I'm going to now convert this into a permanent policy. They can't ask you if you got cancer. The only thing they're going to look at is your oh. age. And then now you just, it's going to be a bigger premium, of course, but now it's going to last until the end of your life. Which is one of the things I also tell people if you're on a start on a smaller budget, let's just get everything in term. And then at some point we could do a partial conversion where we could get part of that into a permanent policy. Mm -hmm. So there's a that's, lot of That's great. That's the question I was going to ask was what would be, you know, what would be the reasoning behind that? Like you need, you can't afford a term policy. You could afford to get started with a, I mean, you can't afford a permanent policy because they're more expensive, correct? Correct. And then, so you could then do term for now and then convert, convert it, it later yeah. if you wanted, okay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Now, now you mentioned earlier about 
someone buying a policy for a baby. Mm -hmm. um, was that a permanent policy or a term policy? That was a permanent policy. Permanent. Okay. Yeah. So you have your like your Gerber policies, which give you about ten thousand dollars worth of life insurance coverage. Um, and then eventually converts into, um, it's a whole life policy, which I didn't even go into like the different types of permanent and, um, and um, term policies, which I'll touch, I'll touch base on in a minute here. Um, but yeah, so one of the things will, and, and the ones that the policy I prefer is what's called the index universal life. And the reason, there's a few reasons why I like it. It's going to be one of the lowest costs, but it has the greatest potential for cash accumulation. Um, and they also come with the living benefits. And what's good about getting it for somebody who's a child is almost all children are, are qualified for it unless they have an underlying, like they have type 1 diabetes, they, they're, you know, they've already gone through three or four heart surgeries or they have some kind of disease. But other than that, most children qualify for um, life insurance without having to, to go through all the medical underwriting, which is, and you're never gonna get life insurance for a less expensive cost than you will today, for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, as most people, each day they get older, they get a little bit more healthy. They're, like we talked about, you get that one, one more day closer to death. So for the most part, life insurance is going to be less expensive today than it will be in the future. There's some exceptions. You give up smoking. Smoking is very expensive when it comes to life insurance. Um, if you're obese, um, if you lose the weight, you may get a lower life insurance rate because obesity is a risk factor. So those are things that they look at. They look at your mortality. So how long, based on your lifestyle, your current medical conditions, do they expect you to live? And they're going to they're gonna kind of roll the dice and say, okay, well, based on X, Y, and Z, we're going to think Christine's going to live to age 81. And so we're going to base her premium on that because of her height, her weight. She's married. She's a homeowner. She's a business owner. And so those type of things tend to give a give you a better rating versus somebody like myself who is single and is overweight. It's going to be harder for me to get a, a more affordable life insurance policy. Mm. That being said, what I did is I got myself a life insurance policy. And as I lose the weight, I'm just going to requalify in a couple years to see if I could get myself a lower rate, even though I'll be two years older, I may be at less risk. So they may give me a better rate then. So those are things to, to really look at is like, oh, I'm not going to wait until I lose weight to get myself a life insurance policy because mm -hmm. I need to protect my foundation. I need to make sure, God forbid, something happens to me. I have money there to take care of my mom. I've got business. I've got business partners that if I pass away, something's going to like, they're going to have a loss in income because of the in income I generate for them. And so I'm just going to see if I could get myself a better rate. So the best time to get life insurance is today. Um, the best time to review your life insurance policies is today. And if you have a good advisor that you're working with and they review your stuff, they're going to tell you you're good. Don't touch anything. And I've done that in the past. You know, somebody's come in with a, a whole life policy that's 13 years old. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to get you a better policy. I think we can maybe get you some more insurance, which we've done but I won't necessarily in immediately replace the policy just because I'm the new person on the, on, on the table. Does that what make does sense? Whole, what does whole life mean? That's a good question, Patty. So it's a permanent type of insurance. So when it comes to permanent insurance, you have whole life, which is like the original permanent policy. And then it eventually um, evolved to what's called universal life, which they give you like a fix, a smaller fixed percentage. So a whole life will guarantee about a 5% rate of return on your cash value every single year. Mm -hmm. To get that rate of return, they cost, it costs you a lot of premium. Mm -hmm. So what they did is so we'll give you a smaller rate of return and we'll, we'll charge you less money. So we'll only charge you like 3% because that covers inflation. 
So we'll charge you a three, or we'll give you a 3% rate of return, but it's going to be a lot less expensive. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is you have variable universal life where your cash value is dependent on the stock market. So um, most people have got away from a variable universal life policy because God forbid you need that cash value and there's a hit in the market like there was in March. Like right now. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're going to, you're still going to have your base insurance policy, but your cash value, excuse me, your cash value is going to be less and it costs more money because you have to have somebody managing the, the money that's in the stock market. And then you have what is one of my go-tos, but sometimes I'll use whole life is an index universal life. And so what the company, and not to get too far in the weeds here, but what the insurance company does is they'll pick like the S&P 500. Does everybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. So what they do is they invest their money and they'll go, okay, we started your policy, let's say on May 1st of 2020. On May 1st, 2021, let's say the S&P 500 went up 6%. So what they're going to do is they're going to credit your account 6% based on the S&P 500, but they're investing in bonds and and the, in the stock market and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What's also good about the index universal life is let's say you had $50,000 of cash value in an index universal life and the markets went down, you don't lose any money. You still have $50,000 of cash value in there. They call it a zero as your hero. So you may not earn any money that year, but you're never going to lose money that you've already earned in your index universal life policy. Okay. Wow. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's reasons to use index universal life. If it's a really long term, like a retirement play, maybe you're looking at 20 years for, you know, a child's education um, where you don't necessarily need the cash value right away, um, but you'll be there if you need it. The costs are lower. So long term, it's going to keep your premium down. Universal index universal life, or it's called an IUL is a really good way to go. If you're, uh, anybody here invest in real estate? So, um, or a business owner, there's this, this concept that's called infinity banking where you basically use your life insurance as a, your own bank, where you have more cash value available right away. It costs you more, but you're able to use, use the cash value with, within the first year, um, almost 90% of it. So then a whole life policy might be the best route for you. So it really depends on your situation to say, is a whole life or is an IUL the best way for you to go? Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people are like, I just want a death benefit. I don't care about the cash value. I just want, I want to make sure that if I live till a hundred, I want it to, I want it to be there. And that's where we bring in the universal life. So basically the insurance company keeps most of the cash value in there. Um, they give you enough to kind of keep your policy costs down to help it basically self-sustain itself. Um, and so those are really good because it's, it's kind of falls somewhere between like an IUL and a term policy. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow. So, you know, one of the things that I always struggled with is when I would think of insurance or life insurance, I would think of leaving it for my loved one, you know, mm -hmm. not, I never thought of it in terms of myself and a benefit to me. So I have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned like if you had a business partner and having it there, if something happened to you, like would you have a set, would someone like that have a separate policy for protecting their business partner situation versus their family? Yep. Um, exactly. Or could you have one policy and have multiple beneficiaries? Both. You can have both. Oh, you can. Okay. You can. So. Um, and then. Oh, go ahead. No, I was. I was going to say you could have as long as you have an insurable need, you could have as many life insurance policies as you want. Because there's a there's a an index that that says okay, it, you know, um, you know, Lori, you have an insurance company with our insurance policy with this company and this company. And when you fill out a life insurance application, they'll ask, do you have any other policies? Is this replacing a policy? Because they don't want somebody who's making $30,000 a year to go out there and apply for a $10 million life insurance policy. That being said, sometimes somebody needs a $10 million life insurance policy. As long as you can prove 
you need the insurance, they'll give it to you. Okay, so my follow up question is, um, I always looked at it and, and I have, I, I, because I have a financial advisor and she recommended that I get the, you know, the term life type of situation where, where I would have coverage. So I'm single, I don't have kids, I don't have, you know, my house is paid off, I don't have anything I need to protect. So I never thought about having that except for, you know, long term benefits and things like that. Like I need to make sure because I don't have someone else that can take care of me, Michelle, like you are with your mother. Um, but, you know, I, th I think it was confusing to me that you can access and cash that out. So it's like you keep talking about using it and the cash value and all that. And I think I wasn't clear on the fact that you could cash out if you needed it. Yeah, so um, I, I, I should have had an example of, a, of what a policy would look like. Uh, but let's say you purchase $500,000 worth of coverage. And, um, and let's say that, and it depends when we're talking about like the living benefits, let's just say we're talking about living benefits because there's multiple different ways. We're looking at living benefits, depending on the severity of your illness is how much money and how old you are would be determine how much money you would be able to pull out of it. Um, so let's say, you had a stage, say you had stage one cancer, where you're like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to be in chemo for the next six months, but after that, I'm going to be raring to go again. So out of your $500,000 policy, they may advance you, say, $80,000. The rest of your death benefit is still going to be there. And if you have, God forbid, you have a, um, it comes back, say, in seven years, you'll still have a new claim because you'll still have your policy there. On the flip side, let's say you have, say, stage four cancer, where you're probably going to live more than 24 months, um, but it's it's kind of a kind of worst case scenario. They'll give you a couple of options. They're like, we'll give you 430 thousand to take it out all today, and that's the that cancels your insurance policy. Or you could take a a smaller portion of that. So maybe you take 300 thousand dollars to to live on. And then you still have that that two hundred thousand dollars or one hundred eighty thousand dollars there to be there as a death benefit. Does that okay. make sense on the living benefits? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's say you wanted to take it out. Let's say you um, what we say is putting it more into the policy than what just the policy cost. So imagine you have an egg, right? You have your egg yolk and your egg white. So your egg yolk is your cost of insurance. So let's say you're putting $500 a month into this every single month, but your cost of insurance is only $100. Guess what's going to that extra $400? It's going towards your cash value. It's going to, to, to get that, you know, that average of that 6% growth every single year. So let's say you put money into this um, over the next 20 years, and now you're ready to retire. And let's say it's built up to a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000. And you start pulling out a monthly income off of that every single, every month that you're, and they're guaranteeing that those money will never run out for you. What it does is it decreases your death benefit every single month. So let's just look at an annual basis. Let's say you, um, you have a $500,000 policy and you pull out $25,000 a year. You're like, I need, I want a couple, couple thousand dollars each month. So now after you, that first year, now your new death benefit will be $475,000 because you've taken $25,000 out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And guess how much you have mm -hmm. to, how much taxes you pay on that 25,000? None, none. None. Now, can you, uh, Take cash out before you've accumulated the cash. You have to accumulate. You have to before accumulate. Before you can pull out. Yes, can in that use, scenario, yes. Okay, and can you use the cash for educational purposes, not for a child, but for yourself? Let's say you want to go back to school. You could take the money and go to Vegas and have a hell of a weekend oh. if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good right now. <laughs> right? Oh, 
Yeah, when it's open. But they, that's the good thing about taking the money out of the life insurance. It's, it's your money. So it doesn't matter if it's used for education, for retirement, if you want to invest in a, in a property or a business. Um, it doesn't matter. You get to use it for whatever reason you want to. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you, um, when you, when you buy a policy, do you have to put in a big chunk before or, and then that you do a car when you buy a car or a house, you can nope. just start making the small payments or. Yep. Okay. And, and the way I design the policy is I find out what your needs are. I find out what your budget is because it doesn't make any sense for you to, for me to design a plan that doesn't, that you're not going to be able to keep long-term. Right, because in a permanent life insurance policy, they're like, this is gonna last you for the rest of your life. So let's say that first year you built up 2000 in cash value, depending on how it's designed, you may only have access to about 500 that first year. Cause they're gonna keep a little bit aside to help pay down some of your cost of insurance early. So it keeps, so it's more affordable long-term. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. So no, you don't have to put a big down payment in it, but it does have a flexible premium. So what we'll do, what I'll design is I'll kind of find a midway point for you. And I'm like, okay, you could put up to here in it, but you could pay as if you run into like COVID-19 and you're like, I only can make a, a minimum payment. This is what we could do for you. So I find a good middle of the road and also why you need it. If you're building it just for cash value, I'm gonna get you a very little death benefit so that way more of your money is going towards the investment. Now, if you need it for the death benefit, you want it for those long-term care benefits, I'm gonna make sure that that's what gets sustained long-term. And so sometimes it's even two permanent policies. Where you're like, I want the cash value, but if I need my living benefits, I don't want, my, I don't want them touching each other. So I'll do two permanent policies too. Okay. Um, I, Michelle, I have another question. You talked about uh, insurance for um, partners in business. Is there any benefits to getting insurance um, if it's just myself and I don't have a partner? It's only good if you have a partner to buy out, right? Well, I only really touched, touched on that. So it kind of depends. Like, do you have, like, is anybody dependent on your income? Um, uh, a spouse, you know, your children, um, would you want to, like, you've got maybe who somebody's not in business with you, but they have, um, but you, they depend on you on income. Like, I'm not saying an employee, but maybe like a key person. Um, I'm going to back, I'm not even, yeah. So there could be a reason why you could, you could use it um, and you could deduct some of the cost if you have like a corporation. So you could use your corporation to buy your personal insurance. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when I was talking about the key person, sorry, I, I kind of got sidetracked there. So a key person, say, uh, Monique, let's say you brought in a, a designer who was just like out of this world and she was so important to your business that you're like, man, if something happened to her, like my business would take a hit. Um, because she has this whole exclusive line for me that's, you know, really famous. Um, what you could do is you could purchase a policy for her. God forbid something happens to her. Um, wow. That policy would reimburse you so your business doesn't take a hit and doesn't fall. It would still help pay for, you know, either for you to find somebody or replace that income that would, would cost, would, that you would lose. Mm -hmm. And that would be a term or a permanent? It depends. Does it matter? It doesn't okay, it matter. It could be either or. Yeah, it could be either or. Mm -hmm. Okay, it definitely could be okay. either or. So one of the stories I love telling people is I'm a huge sports fan, but do do you ladies know who Jim Harbaugh is? Mm -hmm. Sure. So he's yeah. So one of the ways that Mission can pays him is they give him what's called an executive bonus policy. So they um, they designed it where he's going to get seven million dollars of tax free income or death benefit at the end of his at, um, at the end of his life. Um, and they've just decided like, instead of paying you cash, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put this money into a life insurance policy for you. 
Now he's got the tax-free income and his family's got the death benefit. God forbid something happens to him. And then Michigan still gets to deduct it as a employee expense. Wow, that's interesting. That is really interesting. And what's really cool about that is let's say, let's say Monique, you have this designer and then you've got, say you've got 10 seamstresses that, you know, that are making all of your clothes. And you're like, I can't really afford retirement plans for all of them. Or, you know, I don't want to, like, I don't want to give them as much as I give my designer. So what you could do is you could actually discriminate with this type of life insurance plan. And you could give them the life insurance plan then just every, offer everybody else basic, a basic retirement plan. So it allows you to discriminate against your, your high paying employees and it's a way to retain talent too. Hmm. Wow. Well, Michelle, this was really, really enlightening. I mean, I, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I just feel like I've been schooled and, and I, yeah. I had shared with Michelle that I, I have a fabulous financial planner who also manages all of our insurance and so forth. And I still feel like I just learned so much more even, you know, just brought things into, into clarity. So thank you so much. Any last questions, ladies, before we, we wrap up for the day? Okay. I well, I put my info in the chat. So if you ladies have any questions, feel free to shoot me a text or send me an email. If you want a policy review, um, absolutely complimentary. Uh, be more than happy to, to just review what you have to make sure it's on track with what you want. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I'm here to be a service for you ladies. Yeah, so make sure that, you, uh, that you've got her contact. It's Michelle Farrell at the Financial Architects, phone number 909-367-3208. And it's Michelle at, and that's Michelle with only one L, Michelle at tfainsuranceadvisors.com. So again, thank you, Michelle. This has been really enlightening. I hope you guys have all enjoyed it as much as I have. And I would really encourage you to tell your colleagues, tell your friends, tell your enemies about the value that you get on an Ask Me Anything and, and be sure to share this around. Thanks again, Michelle, and everybody You're have welcome. a really wonderful, wonderful day. You too, ladies. Thank you, Patty. Bye. Bye.